Reformed Church. I had mentioned fasting and, and, and correlated that to works, right, and to the works of the law also. Um, in, in Galatians, let me just show you this. Maybe this is a good place to start. Galatians 2.21 he says, I do not set aside the grace of God because of righteousness. Uh, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Right? Let, let's read that again. I do not set aside, right? I don't set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now, it, th that's a, a cool um, correlation to put together in your mind, right? Because he doesn't say, I don't set aside the grace of God because if grace comes through the law, right? He, he, he says, I don't set aside the grace of God uh, for, for, right? Which is, you know, for is indicating, right? Therefore, right? According to the first statement, that if, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So what's the correlation between the grace of God? What's the correlation between grace and righteousness and what's that correlation then what does that have to do with the works of the law right um and so if you if you kind of break it down a little bit right that the the, the grace of god is all that we have freely received of the lord right um in, in this instance right the, the the things that we have freely received from god apart from our works right the things that we have freely received from god apart from our works so then he says for if righteousness comes through the law, for if the justification for our sin comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So what, what you know, like things like that, a lot of times for whatever reason, I kind of I kinda see them backwards and then how they flow here, right? So Jesus Christ died on the cross, right? Which is what made us righteous, which gives us access to the grace in which we stand, right? That's that verse just read backwards, right? Christ, he, Christ died on the cross, right, in order to make us the righteousness of God, right, which is our access into that which God has freely given. So if you set aside, if, you, if, we, if, if we or anyone ever in our thinking, right, set aside the grace of God, what we're setting aside is the work of God, right? What we're setting aside is the labor of Christ, and normally, the reason why the labor of Christ is set aside, it's for our own work, right? The reason why the labor of Christ is many times set aside is for our own labor. And when you set aside the labor of Christ, when you put that aside, you've put aside the grace of God, right? So, so you, you put aside what you could freely receive, right, for what you're trying to earn by your own work, right? So... And, and that, you know, that's an interesting, you know, it's an inter interesting concept because when you, I had mentioned fasting when we, when we just first started a couple of minutes ago, and it's an interesting thing of how, how fasting and uh, um, mourning and grieving in sackcloth and ashes, right? Like how, how that was, a, was normally a response to a situation, right? So in other words, something grievous happened and, and people would revert to mourning and grieving for their circumstance. Now, it, without the knowledge of Christ, right, mourning and grieving is justified, right? Because, because what, what else are you gonna do, right? Without Jesus, that, that's what you're gonna do. But, when, but the, the thing to know when we see when you see mourning or when you see grieving. Now, I, I know that in our minds, you know, that we, we put ourselves a lot of times out of that category. Like anyone who would mourn or anyone that would grieve over anything, you kind of put yourself aside from that because you say, well, I don't, you know, when, when, when a problem happens or when I see something happen in the world, you know, I don't, I don't mourn and I don't grieve. But, but let, let, me, let me just bring you this example maybe before we keep going with that explanation. So when, when, when you think something wrong or when you do something wrong, right, uh, something that you don't agree with, right, it is, is our, like, what, what is it that we revert to, right? When you do something wrong or you do something that you don't agree with, like, what, what is it that we revert to? Do we, do we begin to rejoice in what Christ has done? In other words, do we allow, do we allow our hearts, our minds to be comforted. And that's, I think that's a real important thing, right? 
for today, but that do we allow the Lord, the Spirit of God, to comfort your mind, right? And there is only one way that your heart is comforted, right? In, in whether it be something that you've done, whether it be something that's going on in the world that seems grievous, whether it be something that's going on in the world that seems overwhelming, there's only one way that the heart of men is comforted, and that's actually by the renewal of your mind. When you, when you, when you see, when you, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it even this to you, that even as you begin to hear, as you're growing in the understanding of something, your heart can be immediately comforted, immediately. Not, not something all that you have to grow for a year in, but you, you, you can be immediately comforted in your heart and mind when you allow the Spirit of God to speak truth to you. That doesn't mean that you're establishing that truth, but that does mean that your heart is comforted. In other words, when you hear the truth about your circumstance, when you hear the truth about who you are and what you have, compared to whatever it is that's going on or whatever that's you, that you've done, right? In other words, that, that should be the reaction of a believer. The reaction of a believer should be, regardless of what you've done, how long ago it's been, or regardless of what you see going on in the world, rejoicing should be should be our reaction. Now, to, to most people, that sounds ridiculous, right? Like, why would I ever rejoice when, when I've d just done something wrong? Well, the thing is, if, if you look at it this way, then what, what, is, what, is the, um, what, what is the opposite of what you can do? Because here, here's something you can do. So you do something wrong, and then you can just start feeling horrible about it. You know, like, like, like I just feel so bad about this. Like, I know that this, this doesn't please God. And you start having all these thoughts, right? I, I know that this is not acceptable to the Lord, right? Well, the thing is, thoughts like that, it's obviously from being wrong, the fact that you don't even understand or haven't heard what is acceptable to God, right? Because that is one of the things that the Lord mentions about fasting in the Old Covenant, right? That he, I mean, people that are just grieving and mourning, right? He would say, like, is this, is this what you think is acceptable to me? Like, is this, is this the fast that you think I've called for? Is this what you think, is this what you think I want from you? Like, like it, that's an awesome question for the church to ask itself, right? When, when, you, when you've done something wrong or when, when there is something going on in the world that needs, uh, I'll say it like this, but I don't, this is not correct, that needs God's attention, right? Because that's how sometimes people see it. They're going through something and they somehow got to get his attention because and, and people never, ever say it in these many words. Like, they would never say, like, God has no idea what the heck is going on, so I got to get his attention, like, hey, over here, like, look at me, right? But, but, but we do think like that many times, right? People think like that. People, people think like they need to get his attention. So a way to get the, the attention of God is for him to see your mourning, for him to see your grief, right? And if God can see my grief, surely because God is compassionate, He'll do something if he can just see my grief. But what God is asking is, is that what you think is acceptable to me? That in order for me to move, quote unquote, right, we'll, we'll possibly get into the fact that there is nothing that God needs to do anymore, right? We're, we're waiting for God to move when he doesn't have to move. I was just talking to, you know, uh, uh, a loved one, a family member about this. Like, like we, we're waiting for God to move when God has already, when God has already freely provided everything that is needful but sometimes we set it aside right god has already provided and put on the inside of us the inheritance that he needs to give us he's already provided all that's needful for him to provide. i think that was galatians 2 21 that we were reading right but 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 sometimes we set that aside for what for for our own work for our own grief for our own supposed repentance right because we think the repentance right because i know fasting and mourning that that seems you know, a little foreign to us, right? We think the repentance that God is looking for, we, the church believes that the repentance that God is looking for is, is a heart that is like, like, like hanging your head low, self-abasement, right? Self-discipline, self or that you would, you know, if you do something wrong, then just lock yourself in a room and just read the Bible for at least an hour. And, then, right, and, and, and we would say, no, well, no, what I'm doing is that when I do something wrong, I just want to refocus my mind. Well, you know, if, if that's actually really what we want to do, and we just actually want to, um, just want to put our minds on the truth, then, then I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with you 
stepping aside and just saying, you know what, I just want to spend some time with the Lord because I, I notice my mind is not right. But the thing is, but if, if we would recognize, you don't need to put yourself in some kind of a somber state, right? And, and, and there's no other way to put it. it. It's just guilt, right? It's just guilt. It's just guilt and condemnation, right? Because you're, 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 you want to put yourself down and you don't want to associate or do anything, you know, do anything that would seem very happy or very joyous because you've just done something that you don't agree with and therefore in your way of thinking, this is not acceptable to the Lord. Therefore, right now I have to do something, right? That's just called work, in other words, if we're going to do something because we want God to do something back, that's just work, right? That's just work. That's all that it is, right? There's a, there's a difference between doing something to receive something from God or doing something in order to become more cognizant of what you have, right? Those are not the same things. Those are two separate things. You, we, 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 in, in other words, we think that an appropriate response we think that an appropriate response to doing something that you don't agree with or seeing or being involved in a situation that is grievous, and I say grievous because that's the, that's the most general word that I can think of. It's just anything bad going on that, that is affecting you or affecting someone that you care about or affecting someone that you love, even if it's not directly affecting you. Maybe it's indirectly affecting you because they're a family member and they're going through something, right? But whatever it is that's going on, we think that the acceptable, the acceptable response to that is this, is this self-abasement. It's this, this, this getting God's attention. It's this, this, this putting myself down in order so that somehow I can be picked up, right? Let, 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 let me show you something. If we go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter uh, 58, Isaiah chapter 58, and verse number three, if we can look at that real quick. Isaiah 58, verse number three. This is the people saying, it says, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Right there, it shows clearly that the fasting that they are calling fasting is to be seen of God, to get his attention. That's clear as a bell. That's what that is, right? Why have we fasted and you haven't seen? Why are they saying that he hasn't seen? Right? The reason why they're saying that he hasn't seen, I'm reading out of the New King James Version, right? The reason why they're saying that he has not seen is because they have not seen themselves a response to their problem, right? They have not seen a resolution to their issue. So they say, why have we fasted and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls? Why have we afflicted our minds? Why have we abased ourselves? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In other words, we're trying to get your attention and you ain't doing nothing right? That is not, that is, this was written years ago. This was written years before even Christ ever came to the earth, right? But yet today, that is still a predominant thought in people's minds. Saved or unsaved, this is a predominant thought. There are people that don't bother going to church and don't want to hear anything about Jesus because Jesus has never done anything for me. That's probably the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Everything God has ever done was to be able to bring to pass that which he needed to do for the world that he has already finished. God has done, God has saved the world, right? But yet people would say, people would say, well, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't serve God. I don't want to have nothing to do with him because he, haven't, he hasn't done anything for me because look at what happened, right? But what we don't see is we don't see, we don't, we don't teach enough, right? That it is being able to teach enough to, in, in just, to put it plainly, right, to be able to leverage what Christ has done, to be able to see what the Lord has done so it can be leveraged for us now today in this world and in the lives of other people, right? But they say, why have we afflicted our souls and you take no, no notice? Indeed, it, the Lord says, indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. It says, you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high to make your voice heard, right? We think, we think that what causes God to hear our prayers is if you're like, if you're abasing yourself, if you're, if you're just, you know, whatever, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it, I, I can't believe that I've done this again, Lord, and you know my heart, and you know this, and you know that, you know. It, it, listen, any, I, we, we, were, we were speaking this last service, the, the, the fact that we, that the church itself, right, that people in general, right, have to get over themselves to be able to see what he's done is still a standing truth, right? Anytime that you, 
that you're speaking or you're praying is about what you've done. In other words, it's about your action. Right? Think about Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21 that we were reading. If righteousness comes through the law, in other words, if, if righteousness comes through my works, then Christ died in vain. He said, I don't set aside the grace of God. Whenever you, you begin to pray or your thinking is surrounded uh, about with your actions and what you've done, you're, you're setting aside the single most important thing, which is the righteousness that you have because of what he's done. You're setting that aside because you want to feel something because of what you've done. Because we think that if, if almost like if you feel, if you don't feel anything about it, then it's worse than if you felt some sort of guilt or pressure or bad feeling about something that you've done. But, but it, the thing is, it has nothing to do with your guilt, right? What, what we do, what we do and the correction that needs to happen in our mind doesn't stem from guilt, right? Correcting wrong thinking in your mind, which is where actions come from, right? Never stems from the recognition of, of the sin. It comes from the recognition of Jesus. It doesn't come from the recognition of sin. It comes from the recognition of Jesus who justified you from all sin, right? So it's, it's, it's not about trying to ignore anything. It's not, trying about, it's, not, it's not about not trying to think of something. It's about just acknowledging the right thing, acknowledging the right one, right? He says, um, he says to make your voice heard on high. Verse number five says, it is... Um, is it a fast that I have chosen? The Lord says, right? Is it a fast that I have chosen? For, it says, for a, man, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day, right? An acceptable day to the Lord? Like, is this what you think that I want from you? You know, like if, if you look at this from the perspective of God for a second, look at what he's done through Jesus Christ to save the world. And the world thinks that what God is looking for, instead of to put faith in Christ whom he sent, the world and, and much of the church believes that what God is looking is for self-abasement, that what God is looking is for you to just roll around. And, and, and I say that sometimes in a funny way, like to roll around the ground. But what we're talking about is just mourning, grieving, condemning yourself, feeling guilty for what you've done. That's all that that is. The church believes that that is actually what he wants. And, and even further, that what the Spirit of God in you does is that he actually is making you feel that way that he's making you feel guilty, that he's making you feel condemned. And now, of course, we don't want to say condemned, but just say feel bad. He's making you feel bad so that you would recognize your sin. Yet the one who is the testimony in you, which is the spirit that the church speaks about, is actually doing the exact opposite he wants, he wants to do. He doesn't want you to recognize your sin. He wants you to recognize the one who justified you of your sin. Right? Because without you recognizing him who justified you of your sin, you're, you're not in a place to be able to access the grace in which you stand because it is, only, it is only through the righteousness that you possess that you have access into everything that has already been freely given you. And while we're in the camp of where we're concerned still about us, right? what we're doing is what we're setting aside, right? what we're setting aside is actually what he's done. But, we, but thinking, though, all along in our mind that this, is, that this is sort of what God wants. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He says, is this what you think I find acceptable for you to hang your head low? Is this what you think I find acceptable for you to spread out sackcloth and ashes, right? I mean, that's what they used to do, right? And, and I, I don't know this for sure, but when I think about sackcloth and ashes, I think about them being clothed with sackcloth, which is... Just, I think about a rough material. Not, not a, it's not about comfort. It's not about everything that Jesus has given you, but it's about you, you feeling uncomfortable. You, you throwing ashes upon yourself, right? You, you just, just the sense of feeling, just feeling dirty, feeling down because, you know, how could this be happening to a loved one that I want? And I, I have to reach out to God and see if there's some way that God will find it in his mercy to help my family member. You know, it's just, it's, it's thinking that is not what? That is not according to Christ, right? Just thinking that is not according to Christ. Look, look at the opposite. Look at, look at the contrast. That's Isaiah 58, right? Look at the contrast in Isaiah 61. 
to the same mourning, to the same grieving, to the same sackcloth, and to the same ashes. Look at Isaiah 61 and verse number one. Jesus said, like, this is the reason why I've come. And the reason why Christ came is, is, is you can get from this what is it that God actually really wants, right? Isaiah 61 verse one, it says, the spirit of, of God, the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, right? He has, his spirit is upon me to preach good tidings. In other words, he's, he's saying, he's saying, I know that you, you see yourself in mourning and you see yourself in sackcloth and ashes. You, I, you see yourself grieving and, and, and this constant murmuring of this depressed type of prayer, quote unquote, that you think that you're bringing to God, that you think is what he wants, right? And he, Jesus saying, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's anointed me to be able to preach the good news to you, to preach and say something to you that would lift you, to preach and say something to you that would get you thinking, not, not down in the dust, but for you to understand that what you could not do, I have done for you. What you could not do, I did what your loved ones could not do for themselves, I have done for them. If you feel a certain way because of something that's going on with someone that you care about, how much more the Lord right which sent his son because of what he knew that we were going through that we could not do right god has resolved that that whole feeling that whole thing of of the feeling that we feel when somebody else is going over going so when something is going on in their lives god has already resolved that right that that's what he did and what he did for us because what he did for me he did for you what he did for you. He did for every single one of your family members, right? So um, imagine if instead of us wasting our time, wasting our time, wasting our time, so grievous and mourning and trying and fasting and trying to get God's attention, right? If instead we took that time to be reminded about what he's done and you could actually speak something good to someone, to the one that you're so concerned about, how about if you spoke something that's good and right to them, right? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach. He's anointed me to speak. He's anointed me to be a herald. That's not talking about pastors. That's talking about all of us, right? He's anointed me to be a herald, to speak the good things that he's done for us, to speak the good things that he's done for us, right? To speak, you know, for us to even think, for the church to even think that God is even <laughs> happy, I mean, he, he doesn't even say happy. He says, is this what you think is acceptable to me? Like, do you think I accept that? That you're mourning, that you're mourning and that you're fasting? You think I accept that? But, but the thought is, well, how would God not accept mourning? How would God not accept me just crying my eyes out, asking him to please help me? Because we're setting aside the help he's already provided. It's not that God is, you know, God is like unfeeling is that he already felt and he already did. God already so loved the world and gave. <laughs> the, the, the thing is that we're insulting what he's already done. It's complete unbelief. That's why it's called unbelief. I, I'm sure, I'm positive that the people of Israel, I know we always see it written, right? Like they were coming against Moses because they were thirsty or coming against Moses and Aaron because they were hungry. But I'm sure that was actual real hunger pains that they were feeling. I'm sure that their children were, were saying, Mom, Dad, can you please give me a morsel to eat? I'm sure that they were seeing people even dying, right? People dying in the wilderness just of hunger and of thirst. And, and, and how would they, you know, when, when they're crying out to God to please help, you know, how would they, how would they not think, right, well, well, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what he wants, Right? He's, he's making us suffer this way so that we'll do something. But all along, all that God has ever wanted is that we, in, in that time, right, as they're in the wilderness, that they would acknowledge, right, they, they would acknowledge the words of the prophet, right, that they would acknowledge the word of the prophet that was even with them, like, you know, namely Moses, that was speaking to them in order so that they would grow, so that they would understand, so that they could see, right? And, 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 and us in the place where we are, right, allowing, my God, allowing the Lord to comfort your heart, allowing the Lord to be able to, to, you know, I don't even have to say it any better than that, right? Allowing the Lord to comfort your heart. Look at what he says. Let's go back to Isaiah 61. It says, uh, to preach good tidings to the poor, it, it, uh, obviously, we, we've talked about this before. We've heard, you've heard it many times. To preach the gospel to the poor, to preach good, the good news to the poor, which is to preach to those that 
see their poverty, that see their need, right? That see their need. It, it, what normally when someone is in mourning, when someone is grieving, right? It's because they're, they're powerless themselves, right? They can't do anything, so they, they resort to mourning, grieving, fasting, right? They resort to that because they need, to, in their mind, to reach out to him that's greater, right? Not knowing that the one that's greater is the one that reached out to us, right? We want to reach out to the one that's greater, not knowing that the one that's greater is the one that reached out to you. And that what he wants for you is for you to recognize Isaiah 61, right? He, he wants you to recognize, he says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, all of this good news, right? Liberty to the captive, opening a prison to those that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God. And we'll, we'll show you some cool stuff with that, but it, that, that right there is just really good, right? Not only, not only is there good news from what Christ has already given us, but that God in his, in his current, in this current covenant that we have with him, right? And in, in, in even within the covenant of Abraham, right? The covenant of faith, those that have faith in Jesus, right? That, that the Lord takes vengeance upon anyone and anything because of you, because of you, right? Because of you. So, so, so whether it has to do with God's protection or whether it has to do with something that you need being manifest from inside of you, right? That, that, that is all part of the good news, all part of the inheritance that we have. Vengeance, right? Vengeance, God's vengeance against those that would try to harm you, right, is part of your inheritance, right? It's included in your inheritance, right? It says, um, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort, listen, to comfort all who mourn. He says, if you mourn, God's answer in Christ is to comfort you with the gospel, right? To comfort you with the gospel. To console those who mourn in Zion, right? If you're a believer, the Lord desires always to comfort you, always to comfort you with the truth. To give them, watch, to give them beauty for ashes. There is an answer for sackcloth and ashes, right? Right? There's an answer for that self-abasement. There's an answer for that grieving and that mourning, right? And that is Jesus Christ, right? The, Jesus Christ and him crucified and the glory that he made available to us, right? To give them beauty for ashes. Listen, the oil of joy for mourning. It's the exact opposite, right? People think God wants mourning. No, he wants you to, if you, if you possess his joy, which means that you have his spirit, he wants you to experience that joy instead of experience that mourning. So I know it sounds backwards to people, right? But when you do something wrong, God wants you to feel joy. <laughs> you do something wrong or, you, or, or someone gives you some bad news about a family member. He wants you to be able to rejoice, right? He's put that rejoicing on the inside of you. He's put the knowledge of what Christ has done for that situation in you so that you can have a perfect reason to rejoice. If you didn't have him, you'd have all the reason in the world to mourn. But today we have no reason to mourn because he's fixed it, right? He has fixed the problem. He, he's, we, we have every reason to joy. Every reason to joy. He says the oil of joy, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, right? The garment of praise for the spirit. Of, you see, you, you, you know what you see? Is that it's not what, it's not the grieving and the sackcloth and the mourning and the, the, the guilt and the condemnation and the bad feelings and the remorse, Right? Right? Maybe that's a more common word to people, that, that overwhelming remorse that you want to put upon yourself, right? It, it, it's that, it, it's, it's, it, it's the, the garment of, see, because you can put on different garments, right? You can put on this overwhelming remorse. You can put on that guilt and you can put on that condemnation or you, or you can put on what you already possess, Right? You can put on, you can put on Christ. You can put on a garment of praise, which is exalting the Lord. In other words, it's, it, the garment of praise is, is rejoicing because you're not setting aside everything Christ has freely given you because of the righteousness that is yours through the cross, right? In other words, you're not setting aside the grace of God. When, whenever you do something wrong or you feel bad for somebody, the one thing we ought not to do is we ought not to set aside the grace of God. For anything. There should never be a time in our mind where setting aside the grace of God is an option. So we should not see it like, what am I, believe me, I've asked stupid stuff like this. I have asked, this stuff has flown out of my mouth. Am I supposed to feel good when I do something? Right? And, and somehow we think that that's smart to say that, but that's actually ignorant, right? Am I supposed to feel good about what I do? 
You're not supposed to feel anything about what you do. You're supposed to feel everything about what he's done. Because it is not about what you do. It never has been. Listen, it never has been. Not in the old and not in the new. The law is a different thing, right? But, but, but there were many men that lived under the old, uh, under, under the law, that still lived lives not about what they had done, but about what Christ had done, or would do in their case, right? Would do in their case. David, for instance, right? I'm not saying that they lived that way perfectly, but yet, you know, probably most of us, if not all of us, aren't living that out perfectly right now. And we possess, right? We live after the fact today, right? We live live in the aftermath of all that. But he says, um, in verse number three, if we can go back real quick, Isaiah 61, three, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Watch what he says, that they may be called trees of righteousness because I'm the one that made them trees of righteousness. I'm the one that planted them. They are the planting of the Lord. The trees of righteousness, they should know that they are. I'm the one that made them righteous. So the, the, the fact that he's made us righteous Right? The fact that he has given us the justification for the very thing that we have done or that we see working in the life of somebody else, right? He is the one that provided that justification. So if he provided us that justification, we have every reason to rejoice because now it's not about trying to be justified. He's already justified me. It's not about me trying to get help for my loved one. He's, he already is that help to them. If they don't know it, then they need to know. If they don't know it, then they need to know. There, and there are times, there are plenty of times when people are just not getting it and you offer physical help, right? You can offer, uh, you can, sometimes it's, it's about providing money. Sometimes it's about providing physical help for them, right? Like doing something with your body to help them, right? It, it's some, sometimes it's about work, like you're actually doing work for them, right? Because of where they are and the, the way they're believing. But what we should never do is never go without saying, right? There's never, a t- there's never a time where your work for someone, where you're giving money to someone, where your help for another individual should be substitute for the gospel, right? The, the first thing that Christ was sent to do himself, right, was to preach. That's the f- he, he was sent first and foremost to be a herald. You have been saved and you have come into the kingdom, right, you, for such a time as this. In other words, this covenant. We have entered into this covenant right for the purpose of heralding the good news that's if if you call it your job right like that that is your your first job your first responsibility as a as a believer the first answer that we should have ready on our lips is the gospel faith is in your heart and it is in your mouth that is the word of faith that is preached that's the word of faith that's herald they don't always get it It, it's it sometimes it's not even a comfort immediately to them because maybe initially they even reject it to some people that are open your words can be an immediate comfort to them but then you find yourself sometimes comforting right and then helping also physically that's fine all of that is good all of that is good but we should never allow anything to substitute not in your mind or in your help to set aside the grace of God. Nothing should ever set aside the grace of God. Whether you're helping someone or whether it's about yourself and your own thinking, nothing should ever set aside the grace of God. There is no work that should ever set aside the grace of God. No work, ever, 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 no work. Deuteronomy 10, 12, he says, and now Israel, what does the Lord God require of you? But to fear the Lord, to walk in all his ways and to love him to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, right? What is it that God requires of you, right? That you would, that the one thing that's been mentioned even more frequently recently, right, here, that, that we would listen to him, that we would listen to him, that we would see that's, that's what the Lord is requiring, right? He, he wants me to believe. It's about faith in what Jesus has done, therefore that we would go on listening, right? That we would go on listening. Um, let, let me show you a couple of things. If we can turn to um, the book of Esther, and, and there's a, a I, was just, I was just looking at things again this morning, and I, I've just been looking at certain things that the Lord was showing me in Esther chapter 4. We can go to Esther chapter 4, verse 1. But there's, there's a ton of stuff. There, there is so much in Esther. And I, I, I'm, I know I'm only probably skimming the surface here. But um, so in, in Esther, Esther speaks about the, the persecution of the Jews, Right? Esther speaks about how she uh, 
um, she, as a woman, rose up in um, rose up in the kingdom of King Ahasuerus. Right. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, but I'm, that's how I'm going to pronounce his name going forward here this morning. But King Ahasuerus, he, he was uh, he. Um, she found favor in his sight, whether it be, you know, in his eyes because of her beauty or whatever it was, but she had found favor in his sight. Um, and she had an uncle, I believe it's his uncle, his name was Mordecai, right? Mordecai, um, Mordecai was, um, was found at the, at the gate one day, at the gate to that, uh, the gate of the king. And there was a man named Haman who was given a high rank in King Ahasuerus's kingdom, right? Uh, and Haman had such a such prestige in that kingdom that anyone that saw him would need to bow before him, right? And but Mordecai, being as he was, he refused to bow, right? Bec and and I would I, I would say this as a matter of. Um, opinion right that he would not bow because of his faith right that he would not bow because of his faith what i what i remembered actually what that kind of brought me back when i was reading about how he refused to bow down before haman it, it reminded me of of the jews not wanting to bow down before the beast right in the, in the persecution to come of the jews but but he refused to bow down so we're not going to be able to read all of it but i've highlighted certain certain pieces of the text so I can, we can read it together. So in Esther chapter four and verse number one, um, sorry, so before we go into that, one piece that I didn't tell you. So because of his rebe rebellion, Mordecai's rebellion, Haman worked it out with the king in telling the king what he felt the king wanted to hear. Um, he, what he, told, he worked out with the king was that he would give a decree that the Jews ought to be killed, right? That, they, that their persecution, within that persecution, was to kill every single Jew, whether he be man, woman, child, it didn't matter, is to annihilate all of them. So that decree started going out among all the surrounding areas, right? And then we come into Esther chapter 4, verse number 1. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothing and he put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. So what you see that's important is, is the, the reaction, right? You hear something like that, persecution of believers, persecution of the Jews, right? The response is, I need to get God's attention. His response is, I need to, I need to let everyone know that I am, I'm, I, I am repenting. I am, I'm, I'm showing the Lord by my actions, right? So the Lord will come and he will help, right? That, that, that's, that's what's going on. This is not about acknowledging what the prophets have said, right? This is not about acknowledging the prophet Moses. This is not about acknowledging anything that the Lord had been teaching the Jews from time past. It's just all about just this is what's going on, and I'm going to grieve, and I'm going to mourn, and I'm going to put sackcloth and ashes upon myself, right? And he went, he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one, uh, no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Now, th th there are things here, and, and I'm just going to put them lightly with opinion. I think, I think there are things, there's more to see with all of this. But a lot of this, what I see, there are clear indications that you see in Esther that Haman is really a picture of Satan. And, and I'll show you where I'm getting that from. But that Haman is a, it seems to be a clear picture of Satan, and that in many ways, King Ahasuerus, right, seems to be a picture of the Lord, right? It's just, you know, I, I'll just chuck it up to opinion right now until, because right now everything that I've seen is only in the book of Esther, and there's other things that I've substantiated in other places. So, but you, what you're going to see is a whole lot of mourning and a whole lot of grieving, right, is what you're going to see. He went as far as the king's gate, uh, verse number three, and in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes, right? So there's something going on. Instead of reaching out in faith, instead of loving God with all their heart and their soul, what they were doing was they were working, doing something in order to get God to do something himself, right? 
So Esther's maids in verse number four and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent what? So, so Mordecai is, is at the king's gate, and he's clothed with sackcloth and ashes, right? But, but it, what it said is that you could not approach the king, which is just a cool thought, right? You, you, you don't come near to God because you grieve, right? That doesn't bring you closer to the king's throne, right? You, you don't, you, you, you actually, here it says you're not even allowed to go in to the king, right? You weren't even allowed to go in and see the king in sackcloth and ashes. So he needed to be outside of the gate. But that brings you nowhere with God. You can cry and you can grieve and you can wail and you can do everything you want. But if you're setting aside the grace of God, right, sadly, they ain't no help for any of us, right? There is no help for any of us setting aside the grace of God, right? There is no help for an individual that needs God when what you're doing is actively setting aside the grace of God. You're setting aside the very salvation that's there for you, right? And if for an unbeliever, you're setting aside that which could save you. Right? You just keep pushing it aside. No, I got a better idea. I got a better idea. I got a better way, right? I got a better way. So he, he but, but it's interesting that what Esther does is she hears how he's clothed, right? And she says, here, bring this clothing to him. Bring this garment to him, right? Doesn't it sound a little bit like Isaiah 61? That he gives us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, right? He, he, he wants us to understand that we're clothed, right? That we, we, we can put on a robe of righteousness instead of a robe of mourning and lament, right? That we don't have to lament, but we can rejoice in our righteousness, right? Those are two different garments you can put on. But, but it, it, it's funny because a lot of this stuff, I, I had remembered it was coming back to me a little bit. It had been a while since I had read Esther. But it's funny that you, you know, you see him mourning and you see Mordecai grieving, and you're like, you know what? That ain't going to accomplish anything. That's not going to accomplish anything. And when she sent the garment to him, right, I, I was pretty sure already without reading the rest of it, he's not going to wear it, right? He's not going to wear it. That's, you know what that's called? When, when the Lord wants you to be clothed with your righteousness, to put on the helmet of salvation, and you push that aside because you've got more mourning to do, right? All that's doing is, is it's, just, it's just rejecting, re, is refusing to be comforted. That's just refusing to be comforted, right? You, you, could, you could be comforted by the truth, right? But we refuse to be comforted because we have more wailing to do. And, and Unfortunately enough, I would say that sometimes we get done with it and then we can come to our re realization of what's right and then we begin to hear again, right? But the cool thing is that that could happen much earlier, right? You could know that the Lord is requiring no mourning of you, no mourning, that there is never a day in your life that God will ever say that he was ever requiring mourning from you or grief in any situation. There is no situation that God would ever say that that's what he's requiring of you, that that is what seems acceptable to the situation. For a believer, that is never an acceptable response to anything. Mourning and grief. And I know that's not popular in the world. I'm just saying from God's perspective, right, that is never a thing. <laughs> mourning and grief is never a thing. And I know that all kinds of believers would come out and say, well, how about, you, you're trying to tell me that if, if my mother passes away, there's no grieving? What are we talking about? <laughs> what are we talking about? Are we talking about like God didn't actually tell you to go raise the dead? Are we talking, are we forget? What are we doing? Setting aside the grace of God. That's all it is. It's just setting it aside. I got, I got a way to do it. But the way that we're doing it is just the world's way. The very thing you were delivered from is the very thing that sometimes we revert back to, right? But just because it seems normal in the world does not mean that God, that's God's way. Because we think, because people think that that is God's way, it doesn't make it his way, right? He's, he's so clear, right, in what he requires. But anyway, so he says, so, so then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and to take his sackcloth away from him. Isn't that a cool thing? Like, that's actually what God has done, right? He has removed the sackcloth from us, right? But yet, what does he do? But he would not accept it, right? He, he rejected, he what? He refused to be comforted because he had a better way to deal with God. He had a better way to get God's attention, right? He refused it. Then Esther called the Hatak, one of uh, the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what this, what, uh, what and why this was. So basically, she sends him to say, hey, go find out what, the, what, his, what is his problem. Why is he rejecting to be, why is he refusing 
to be comforted. He comes back and he says all that to her. This is what the king's command is. This is what he sent out. This is what's going on, which is what most people do, right? What's going on? And they'll, they'll, they'll vomit all over you, right? This is all the stuff that's going on in my life. This is why, in other words, what they want to show you is, here's why I'm in mourning. Here's why I'm grieving. And look, look at how bad it is, right? Look, see, look how bad it is. Because what, the response that they actually want from you is for you to feel bad as they feel bad. And, and it's, not, it's not a thing like they want you to feel pain. It's that if you only knew, if you only knew how bad it was for me, you would not talk to me about just the good news because you would understand, right? And that's what people think about God, right? If I can just talk to God about what's going on, surely he will understand and he would help. But the, the, the point is that he has already understood and already has helped, right? Again, it's, setting, it's not setting aside the grace of God, but recognizing what God has already freely given us through everything that he's done, right? It's not setting aside the grace of God. Let's jump down, if we can, to um, verse 13. So, so what, what she says to, to Mordecai, brings back that answer and says, you know, this is what's going on. And, and he says to her, if I can actually find it here, he, he, says, he says to her, like, like she, should, she should, being in the kingdom, she should reach out to the king to try to bring salvation to his people, right? And, but then Esther says in verse number 10, this is 410, Esther spoke to Hattak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except to the one that he holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Now, here's the thing that I, th this, is, this is, again, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly, I, I know that, that, uh, through the righteousness of God, we have life, right? The Spirit is life unto us because of righteousness, right? So that's a truth. Now, I believe that that's symbolic of that, right? That when he, when he what, what she's talking about is no, no, one, no one approaches God without righteousness, right? No, no, one, no one has an audience of God without righteousness. No one can access, let me say, let me say it like this, no one can access the things of God the salvation of God without being made righteous, without accepting the justification from their sin through the cross, right? That's the only way to receive from God is through the cross. So what, what she's saying is no one can go in to see the king unless he extends to her, to her the scepter, right? And the scepter, just to, just to show you very, very quickly here, um, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 8, let's just read it really quick. Hebrews 1, 8. It says, but the son, but to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions, right? So you see a couple of things there, right? You, you, you see him talk about the oil of gladness, which we were just reading in Isaiah 61, and you also see that scepter referred to as a scepter of righteousness, right? So what, what she was saying there, what she was saying to him, no one can come to the king, no one can approach the king without righteousness, right? No one can approach the king without righteousness, which is, uh, which is a truth, right? Um, in verse number 13, sorry, sorry, I might as well just read that last little bit of verse number 12. He says, he holds out the scepter that he may live. Like, that just struck me, right? Like, it went like, like, like if you take a guitar string, you see a guitar, and you take one of those strings, and you go, just go, bing! right? It kind of just struck a chord that he may live, right? But when I read that, I didn't read that like, oh, he extends the scepter to you and then he won't kill you. What I read that as is that through righteousness is how we live, right? That's how we have the life of God is through righteousness, right? So, so he says um, that he may live, yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days, um, so, so they told Mordecai Esther's words. D just something that I want you to remember there, which I think is just kind of cool. I have not been called into the king. What, normally what that meant in that context is when she was called, she was called to the king for intimacy, right? It's not, she's not saying he didn't call me to have cup, a, a cup of tea with him. What she was saying was when you were called, it was one of his many wives, right? He had one for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? And this was one that he would call, and I don't even know how many wives he had. But if, he, if she was summoned by him, 
time, it was, she, it was for intimacy. And that, that is, I'm not just trying to be funny, that is, that is important in a second. Verse number 13, uh, 13 says, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, and Mordecai told him to answer, answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will, will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish, right? And I think there's some significance there, but we'll keep going. Yet, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And you know, there's a lot of things that people use that for, but honestly, the, the correlation that I saw with, with the context is that, is that we that are in the kingdom, that have the kingdom in us, we that are part of the kingdom of God, we have a, been appointed just like Isaiah 61 declares, right? The same way Christ has a, was appointed to preach, to be heralds, to comfort, right? To be a comfort, uh, allow the spirit of God to comfort us and to be a comfort to somebody else, right? By that same comfort that we possess, by the same joy that we possess, by the same garment that we can be clothed with is to help those others, right? That, that's, that's, that's how I see this. The, the the, the same mandate, the same commands that the Lord gives to, to give the good news, to raise the dead, to cast out devils, right? That's, that's the significance that I see of that there. And if, if there's more to that, which I'm sure there is, the Lord will teach us and he'll teach me. Um, verse number 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan um, and fast for me, right? Uh, more fasting, more, more mourning, neither eat nor drink for three days, uh, night or day, my maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So obviously you can see lots of, lots of wrong thinking there, and I'm sure there's many other layers of this, but we'll keep going with that. Verse number 17, so Mordecai went his way, and he did according to Esther, to what Esther commanded. Here's what's interesting in, in chapter 5, if we can go there. Chapter 5, verse 1. He, here, like you see a picture, right, of a terrible situation. Then you see the response to that, which is just a lot of mourning and a lot of groaning, right? A lot of ashes and a lot of sackcloth, which amount to zero, right? Doesn't amount to anything. In, 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 in chapter 5, what I think we see there, and, right, and I, I think you'll see it with me, is a, a symbol of Christ, right? You see a recognition of what Christ has done, the justification from sin, and you see, you see someone approach, right, and and you see salvation, you see righteousness, you see acceptance of what the Lord has done, right? In verse number one, now it happened, it says on the third day, and I think that's just interesting, right? I, I know the reference there is like on the third day after they had fasted for three days, but I don't think the point of the third day is calling attention to their fasting. I think the third day is calling attention to Jesus, right? Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes, right? So here she is, she's gonna come in to see the king, and what does she do? She's not clothed with sackcloth, right? And she's not clothed with ashes. She's put on, it says, her royal robe, right? She's put on her royal robe, right? And stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. And so it was, this is just a beautiful thing, so it was when the king saw the queen standing in the court. Listen, this is just a beautiful thing, right? This has his reaction, his reaction to her has nothing to do with all the fasting and all the grieving that Mordecai did. It had nothing to do with all the fasting that her, that her handmaids did. It had nothing to do with all the grief that they did. None of that got the attention of anything. The only thing that you see here that gets the attention of God is a righteous person coming in clothed in that righteousness. That's the only thing, that's the only thing that 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 the that found the grace of God right that's the only thing that caused anything to happen was the realization of what Christ has done right the realization of the suffering of Christ right he says um so it was when the when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight the king held out to Esther the golden scepter, right, uh, that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. Now, now here's the, the cool thing, that the word touch there has a different spin on it, right? It's not just that she went like that, right? But actually, that word touch there means to lie with a woman, right? That word touch there means to lie with a woman, so you, you see an interesting thing here, right? You see, you see him extend righteousness, and then you see her touch 
right? Touch the scepter, right? And to me, that is a beautiful picture, right, of the Spirit of God coming to live on the inside of us and we becoming one with the Lord, right? That, that when a man, right, lies with a woman, they become one flesh, right? That we that accept the finished work of Jesus Christ and, right, we re- when we receive that righteousness, that justification from sin from the finished work of Jesus, right, we have become one with him, right? That, that, that word, it's it just uh, uh, an interesting thing. It just, like, certain things jump Jump out at you, touch, and I'm like, you know what? That has to be more than just touch it, right? And you could actually look that up on your own. That, that's actually what it means. One of the definitions there is to lie with a woman. Obviously, much of it is just being just to touch something, right? But you can see, right, when you think something, you know, that must mean more than just what it's saying, right? And that just substantiates it, right? That's a good, I, I, I love it regardless of whether I would see that, saw that anyway, but it's good regardless. Um, so, so she touched the top of the scepter, and the king said to her, this is a really cool thing. I was just talking something, I was talking about something with Pastor Mike on the way here, and I was just remembering, it kind of made me kind of chuckle inside when he was saying it, because you know the articles that he's put out uh, recently about, you know, you can have what you want, right? But it's interesting what the king says to her. <laughs> like, he, he doesn't just say, oh, like, you can come here and keep me company. He says to her, the king said to her in verse number three, what do you wish, Queen, King Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you up to half of the kingdom, right? The cool thing is, right, that what the Lord has given us is his kingdom, right? He's given us everything, everything. And the power towards all things that we would need, ever need power for that's in this world. Yet we think, people unfortunately, right, maybe not so much us, but we Christians think sometimes, or people think, that they need to actually, like, shake to God to get his attention, do something in order to get his attention, yet he's given everything. Yet he's given everything. That, 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 that to hear the Lord tell you, right, I have given you my kingdom. Like that's your inheritance. Like this is the inheritance of the sons of God. You know, it, it would make you feel so silly, you know, like why would I not leverage what I possess? Why would I not take advantage of what he's given what am I doing mourning and what am I doing grieving, right? Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Um, and, and Esther says, you know, so, so it's interesting. So she goes through all this, and I'll, I'll speed this up a little bit. He says, what do you want? He says, here's what I want. I want to have a banquet, and I want you to invite. I want you to come, and I want Haman to come also, right? I want, I want both of you to come. So Haman is hearing this stuff. And he is very excited, very excited that, you know, the king has, in, the, the queen, sorry, the queen has sent out a personal invitation just to me, right? And, and now she's inviting him because she says, and you'll see it in a second, says he is, he, it doesn't even say I believe my, he, says, he is the adversary and the enemy. He is the adversary and the enemy, right? So, she, so she, she brings him in, and you see, it's a cool thing, I'll show it to you in a second. You see, you, you see Haman come in and have, have, be given an audience with the king. And what it reminded me of was, was at, during, in the book of Job, how it shows Satan coming in and kind of having an audience to be able to speak to the king, right? And, and how, in the same way that the devil was cast out, right? That in the same way, Haman is cast out here, right? But uh, so, so, so she says, you know, this is my petition. I, I want to have this banquet, right? Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more there to that. Um, in verse number 12 of chapter 5, moreover, Haman said, besides, it says, Queen Esther invited no one but me, to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I am invited, invited by her along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting by the king's gate. Like all that he could think about was the hatred, the hatred that he had for the Jewish people. That's all that he could think about. The hatred for this Mordecai and for his people, right? So, so even above this exaltation that he thought he was getting, right? All he, he was just consumed with hatred, right? Uh, so he tells his wife about this, and he tells, you know, several of his friends, and, and they say, you know what, why don't you just build a gallows, right, 50 cubits high, so that, that in that way you can talk to the king while you have this audience with him, and that way you could have him hung, right? That is actually what the devil used to do, right? The devil would approach God and be the accuser, right? He would accuse us, day and night accuse us before the Father, 
right? And, and that, in other words, that's the leverage that he thought he had, that he could just accuse us and that we would be guilty and suffer the punishment for our actions, right? Yet here, right, he thinks that he's going to do that. And he, he, he does. He builds the gallows, right, as big as day, right? And he goes in to see the queen. In verse number, in chapter 6, verse number 1, chapter 6 and verse number 1, that night the king could not sleep. Uh, so one, so one was commanded to bring the book of the record, uh, records of the chronicles. Now, what that is is what you see in Esther, in Esther chapter two. Like the king couldn't sleep. Basically, was happening. So because he couldn't sleep, he says, "I want you to bring the book of the chronicles and just read to me." But what happened is, as he's it's being read to him, he hears right something being read to him about a man named Mordecai who sees that someone is actually conspiring to kill the king, and he actually communicates that, that these men were conspiring again to kill the king, and then these two men are judged and killed, I believe, right? So he actually saves the king's life. So the king asks, he says, and that's actually Esther chapter 2 is when they talk about that a little bit more. We're in Esther 6, but in Esther 2, in Esther 2 they mention it a little bit more. Um, so, so, in, in verse number three, in verse number three of chapter six, then the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed upon Mordecai for doing this? Like, has anybody done anything for him for this thing that he's done? And the king's servants who attended said, nothing has been done for him. So the king said, who is in the court? And this is the interesting thing. He, he, it kind of changes a second. And he said, first he's inquiring about who has done something for Mordecai. But then he says, hold on a second. Like, who is it that's out there? And they say, um, it said, now Nathan had, uh, not Nathan, no, Haman. <laughs> I don't know why I said Nathan. But uh, now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in, right? So that's, I, I just saw a parallel there or um, a symbol of how Satan having an audience, an audience, right? Like when the angels came before the Lord, also Satan was given entrance to come in before the Lord. Um, so Haman came in in verse number six, and the king said, what shall be done for the man who delights, who the king delights to honor? So now, now he's coming back to Mordecai, but of course, you'll see in a second, that Haman is thinking, well, that's me. So, so uh, he, he's just, Haman is probably, because he's just a ham, right? But anyway, so what, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me, right? Like you see such... What a pompous person, right? Like, what, what, something else. Anyway, but like, like, that's totally, like, that's such a demonic thing. But anyway, verse number seven, and Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delight, uh, for the man who the king delights to honor, let a robe be bought which the king has worn, and, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has the royal crest upon his head. So you, so you kind of hear him saying, like, I want what you have, Right? I want to be clothed with what you have. I want to have what you have, right? Which is actually what the devil wanted, right? That's what Satan wanted. But he says, I want what you have. In verse number nine, let, let the, let, uh, then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most uh, noble princes that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, then parade him on a horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor, that it would be yelled and proclaimed out in front of him. So it's interesting that the very thing that the devil wanted to be equal with God is the very thing that we inherited, right? The very thing that he wanted is the very thing that believers inherited, right? The very thing that, Na I keep saying Nathan, the very thing that Haman wanted, right, was the very thing that the people inherited, right? That, that his arch enemy, the man that he hated the most, right? The one that he had most hatred for, which was mankind, right? is that's what he actually gets. Then the king said in verse number 10, hurry, take, and this is him telling Haman this. He says, take the robe and the horse as you suggested and do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Right? So in other words, go, take his sackcloth and his ashes off and give him the king's robe. Right? Isn't that an awesome thing? Not just a robe. 
the king's robe, not just, not just righteousness, but the righteousness of God, right? Not just, not just any old robe, but that which belongs to me, I'll give to you, right? Not that which belongs to me, I'll give to you. So Haman took the robe and the horse, and he, so he gave all this to him. He paraded him all over. Verse 13, uh, Haman told his wife Zeresh, all and all of his friends, everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Sarah said to him, if Mordecai, now this is an interesting thing. I don't totally understand this, but there's a, like a change of heart here, but it's an interesting thing to read. He said, if Mordecai, this is the wife saying to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him, right? It's just a really interesting thing to say, right? Like the very one who just said to him, build him a gallows so you can hang the guy, right? Is the same woman who's saying now, if he's a Jew, you'll fall, right? If you come against the people of God, the, there will be vengeance from God to you. You'll fall, right? It's just, just an interesting thing. While they, uh, while they were still talking, the king's units came, they said, you know, they, they, Esther is calling him. It's time for you to come to my banquet, right? So, so, so he comes to the, to the, to the banquet. Um, verse, chapter 7, and we're going to be wrapping up here, I think. <laughs> chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. Uh, and on the second day at the banquet of wine, which I know that there's something there. I just, you know, that, that'll maybe be for another day. It calls it the banquet of wine, right? Just a cool thing. The king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted unto you. You see, you see how freely he deals with her, right? The same way we started off in Galatians 2.21, right? It, it, it's, you, don't, you don't set aside the grace of God. You don't, you don't set aside the generosity of God. You don't set aside what God has given for some other cheap imitation of something, right? Never, right? There's n never a need to do that, right? Um, not because it's forbidden, but because it's not profitable to you, right? You want to mourn, mourn, right? But it does nothing for you, right? You want to grieve, grieve, but it does nothing for you, right? It does nothing for you. It's not acceptable to him. It doesn't move him either way, right? Your grief and your mourning doesn't move God this way or that way. He's not displeased with you, and he ain't happy with you. You're just mourning. So mourn then, right? But there is better, right? Don't set aside the grace of God. That brings joy, right? That brings joy. That brings praise to God for all that he's done. That brings praise to God for all that he's done. Thank you, Jesus. Um, um, what shall be done for you up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. Verse number three, then Queen Ansa answered and said, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be given at, at my petition and my people at my request. For we, for we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue. But she's just speaking out of ignorance, right? Like she's just saying, if, if they were just going to make us slaves, I wouldn't have said anything. But it's just, it's just I don't know. The, the word that came up was like fiddle faddle. It's just nothing. It's just fluff. But anyway, but she's at least going to the right one, right? So, so, so uh, she, 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 her thinking is not all right, but she is exercising her right as royal, right? Uh, she says, I would have held my tongue along, although it says the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. And verse number five says, so King Ahasuerus answered and said to the queen, who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? <laughs> like who would be crazy enough to think that he could come against the children of God, right? Who could ever think it would enter into the heart of any individual to ever come against those who I have called, right? So, uh, and Esther said, listen to what she says. And th this is why I really think that Haman really is a symbol of the devil. He says, and Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman, right? The adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath of the banquet. Uh, and so, so at this point, you know, Haman is just freaking out, right? So he's, 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 the king leaves and he comes before the queen, and he's, he's just groveling, and he's throwing himself at her feet. And then the king comes in as she's throwing herself, he's throwing himself across her feet. And then he says to her, he says, he said, will you also assault the queen while she is in the house? 
The interesting thing about that is that the word assault there actually means, will you try to put her in bondage, right? Will you try to assault the queen in my house? Would you try to speak a lie to the children of God to bring them to a yoke of bondage that they have already been delivered from, right? Would you try to assault the queen while she is in my house, right? And as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Naaman's, Haman's face. Um, now, uh, Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Naaman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, right? And that spoke good, just, it just reminds you of praise to God, right? Speaking good, blessing of God. The one that, had, that blessed the Lord, he has spoken against the one that blesses the Lord, right? Uh, he, it's standing in the house of the Naaman, in the house of Haman. I keep saying Naaman, but whatever. We'll call him Naaman, Haman, right? Satan. Then the king said, hang him on it, right? The king said, hang him on it. So, so, they, so they hung or they hanged Naaman. They hanged Naaman on the gallows, which was uh, that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided, right? The king's wrath subsided. In, in Revelation just to read to you real quick here. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 10, then I heard a, a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down, right? And you, you just, it, it just seems like such a, a beautiful picture of that, right? How, how Haman, who came against the people of God, right? Is just cast out. You know, th there is a, there's a thing, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. You know, um, we, we had shared with you uh, from the Helps Ministry, and just, you know, to, just to share with everyone, we are working on, if everything goes good, you know, you might see them out there in the wild, but we are working on these uh, bookmarks, right, so that, so that people can take them and keep them in their Bible or keep them in their book and have a constant remembrance of something, right? But it's a cool thing, you know, as, as Pastor Mike was sharing with the Helps Ministry, what it says on it, the bookmark on it says, don't beat yourself self up over it. Jesus already was, right? And that just really brought me back again. It was just another reminder of, of don't beat yourself up or, up over it. Like, we, we actually think that there is, some, there is something that could happen to someone else or that you could do yourself that would be a reason for you to beat yourself up over anything. But the thing is, how true is that though, right? That, why would you beat yourself over something that he was already beat up for, right? In other words, it, it was your punishment. It was your guilt. It was your condemnation. It, it was your sin. It was your wrong. It was your grief and your family's grief. It was your mourning. It was your hurt. It was your pain. It was your suffering that he suffered, right? Why would we ever think that there is still suffering that remains apart from what Christ has already suffered, right? A suffering that remains that we still have to suffer for whatever we would do or whatever is going on in the family of a loved one, right? All we ever do when we get into that wrong, incorrect, horrible mindset is that we set aside everything that he already suffered to be able to give us. We set aside the grace of God. We set aside that which was freely given to us, right? To do something, right, that ha is absolutely of no effect, that, that does nothing and just makes what he's done ineffectual in our lives, right? But instead, that we would allow the comfort of the Spirit of God, because that is a cool thing to really understand. When, with the, those of us that have the Spirit of God in us, right, that are saved, that are, that are His, He's put that comfort on the inside of us, right? He is, the Holy Spirit in us is the comfort, right? The Spirit, Christ in me is my comfort, right? He is my joy. He is my rejoicing, right? So, no, so what, what helps us think right, right, is the proclamation in our mind. I mean, we are called to be heralds, right? But the first one that you herald to is yourself and your own brain, right? That heralding has to happen here first, right? And as you herald and you, you, you constantly are allowing the Spirit of God to speak the truth into your heart, that you would receive that comfort and that there would never be a day in our life going forward that we would ever refuse to be comforted by the Spirit of God, that you would recognize right away the hand that you are pushing away, that you would recognize the words of whom you're pushing aside because you have a little stint of mourning that you have to do, that you have a little process that you have to go through until you feel better about yourself, right? The, the only one that should make us feel better 
is him, right? I don't have to feel better about myself because without Christ, I can do nothing. There ain't nothing good to feel about. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no good feeling that I could ever achieve from looking at myself, right? But with him, there's a whole lot. There there is a whole lot of joy. There's a whole lot of rejoicing. There's a whole lot of reason to rejoice. So, So I can continually, my mind say, right? I can rejoice and again, rejoice over and over again. So what should we do? right? When something's going on in the world, what should we do when something is going on? What, what should you do when you feel that thing in the pit of your stomach that feels so bad because something is going so wrong, right? That we think that the only godly times in our lives is where everything is going on beautifully around us and nothing is happening in our lives. But the thing is that hasn't changed the cross, right? That hasn't changed the cross and it hasn't changed what you have. Inside of you, zero has changed, Zero has changed. That's why there is rejoicing that can be constant and never-ending because that has never changed, right? Sometimes we don't think that that's important enough, that we think that external circumstances are somehow more important than your actual true reality, right? But continuing to allow the Spirit of God to comfort your mind will teach you the truth, and then you'll see the importance of what you have more and more. You'll see the weightiness the weightiness of what he's done and the weight of glory that you possess on the inside of you. you you'll, the, the scales will go the other way, right? The weight of the glory of God that you possess will far outweigh more and more anything that you see. And I believe that's what Paul was talking about when he was saying that nothing that you go on in this world can ever compare with the weightiness of the glory that we have in us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, my God. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, my Lord. There is such a desire sometimes, Lord, that we have to be able, Lord, and I'm sure there is a time for it, Lord, to be able to bring some, someone up and just to lay hands on them, Lord, and for them to be comforted with that, Lord. But my God, there is such a larger place, such a larger preeminence that there should be in our minds for the thought of the Spirit in us that we already possess, that no one has to touch us to give us, to know that the comforter who is named that way, the one who is the comforter, lives on the inside of me. Lord, that we would receive that comfort, that we would receive that comfort of the Holy Ghost on the inside of us, the Spirit of God that lives and dwells on the inside of us, that we would allow God to straighten out that mind and renew those bad thoughts with the right thinking of everything that we have done so that we would never, ever need to ever set aside what you have done. Lord, that we would have the right reaction and the right response to anything that's going on in this world, Lord, to anything that has happened in our lives, to anything going on in the lives of loved ones around us, to anything, to, 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 to the crisis, Lord, that is around the world. The crisis and the suffering, Lord, and the, and the bombings and the death that is surrounding this world that has always been present, always been present from the time sin came into this world. It is not a new thing. Death and suffering is not new. Just because you weren't seeing it, just because it wasn't close to your home, right, that does not mean that it did not exist. It has always been there. But thank you, Jesus, that no, God, no, no matter the... the the, 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 the distance of that suffering, no matter how close it comes, it will not, my God, it will not come near us, Lord, not come near your people, Lord. Not, Lord, that, that if, if we can see, Lord, the protection of God, that we can see him that is with us, we would recognize speedily, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my God. I pray, my God, that your people, every single one of us, Lord, that hear this, oh, Lord, that we would leave the place, Lord, this time that we would leave here, Lord, rejoicing in our hearts, Lord, filled, Lord, with joy, with rejoicing, Lord, even to tears rejoicing, my God, because it is so good. So good what you have done, my God. So good what you have done, Lord. All glory, Jesus. All glory and honor be to you, Lord. All glory and honor be to you, Jesus. All glory and honor be to you, Jesus. For the accuser of the brethren is no more. The accuser of the brethren is no more. For you have justified us. 
You have justified us and freed us, Lord, from this world and from the yoke of bondage in it. You have freed us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making us free. Thank you for the liberty that is ours. In Jesus' name, thank you, my God. In Jesus' name, for all you've done. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reform Church, you can do so at reforminus.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.